Um, thank you, Munzer, and uh, really good to be with you. Good morning today, and um, I'm glad to be with all of you. My good friend Munzer gave me a very precise topic, the story of the Palestinian church, very precise. Now, remember, the Palestinian church was not started by the Germans in the 19th century, but the Palestinian church was started on Pentecost 2,000 years ago. And actually, that means I have 25 minutes for 20 centuries. That gives me one minute per century. Uh, this is really important to, to emphasize because, uh, you know, uh, I meet lots of people who think the Palestinian uh, church was started by the missionaries from Europe or from the U.S. Uh, and remember, uh, the gospel was proclaimed in Arabic on Pentecost already, according to Acts chapter 2. We like to think that... Uh, uh, the, the disciples started talking in German and Dutch and English. None of these languages is mentioned there, but Arabic is. Okay? And uh, this is why actually the Bible was not written in the Bible Belt. <laughs> Thanks, God. Uh, it is a product of Palestine, and on the back it says made in Palestine. Anyhow, this is just uh, to begin with. Uh, I have a PowerPoint, uh, and um, let me see. Um, I called the title, The Church, the Empire, and the Kingdom. And I will focus really on the last 200 years, because uh, modern history in Palestine start, by, start in the year 1799. Now, empires, it's really important to notice that the people of God in the Old Testament were almost most of the time, if not all the time, living under imperial occupation. Okay? Starting with uh, Assyrians, Babylonians, etc. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, not Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, but Bethlehem, Palestine, under imperial occupation, Roman occupation. In fact, he was crushed by that occupation 30 years later. The longing for the kingdom was a response to the imperial oppression. So our topic, thy kingdom come, has very much to do with the empire. Without empires, Thy kingdom come will not have that same meaning. Now, the empire was Christianized under Constantine in the fourth century, but unfortunately, empires continue to occupy Palestine throughout history up to this date. So that's the background when I talk about empires. Uh, I will focus on, if we look at the story of the Palestinian church in the last uh, uh, 200 years, we can distinguish five stages. The first stage is basically 1831 to the uh, First World War. A Sikh empire, meaning the Ottoman Empire, uh, had to make concessions to another empire, not to the Palestinians, to another empire. Then from... 1917 to 1948, the empire, not the Ottoman, but the British Empire, betraying the church. Then 1948 to 1967, an empire, even by proxy, under a biblical name. 1967, we heard the word divine intervention from Pastor Alex, this is when it was mainly used, 1967. I will come later to that. And 1987 until 2009, the cry for the kingdom. 
So I will go quickly uh, through these five stages. Let's have a look at maybe this, um, uh, this map. Uh, and this map shows actually uh, Palestine in the 19th century was part of the Ottoman Empire, okay? So we were here in Palestine living under Ottoman occupation. 1799, Napoleon came from France and occupied, wanted to occupy Palestine. He couldn't for a reason, so he went to Egypt. This is why Egypt has a different uh, uh, color. After that, this man, an Alpinian from Albania, living in Egypt, um, created a kind of a state in Egypt, and he invaded Palestine in 1831. His name was Muhammad Ali. And that was actually the beginning of the modern history in Palestine. Why? Because Muhammad Ali actually started a revolution in Palestine. This was his statement, 1831. Muslims and Christians are all our subjects. The question of religion has no connection with political considerations. In religious matters, every individual must be left alone. The believer to practice his Islam and the Christian his Christianity, but no one to have authority over the other. That was a revolution. Okay? And an English missionary that year wrote, the Christian missionary enjoys perfect liberty to carry out our operation under the Egyptian government, that's Muhammad Ali, more so indeed than under the British government at Malta or India. Imagine. Now, you would think that the empire would be happy about that, the British Empire at that time, because they were like the most, uh, they weren't happy. And so, 1839, they came to push him back and give the land back to the Ottomans. Okay? 1839. And talking about Christian Zionism, you know, when, when the Ottomans came back to Palestine, now they had to make concessions, concessions to England. And uh, they did that actually 1854. They had a kind of, they call it a reform, Tanzimat, 1854. Now this, uh, uh, this sentence was written exactly in that same year, after the reform by, by a Christian Zionist from England, uh, Lord Earl Shaftesbury. And look how arrogant, how racist this theology is. It says the Turkish Empire is in a rapid decay. We saw it under Muhammad Ali. Every nation is restless, all hearts accept some great things. No one can say what they are. And uh, uh, we are anticipating prophecy. The requirement of it, prophecy, seen nearly fulfilled. Syria, including Palestine, is wasted without an inhabitant. These vast and fertile regions, so it's not unfertile, fertile regions, he's saying, will soon be without a rule, without a known and acknowledged power to claim uh, domination. The, ter the territory must be assigned to someone or other. Can it be given to an European uh, potentate? to an American colony, to an Asiatic sovereign or tribe? Are these aspirations from, aspirants from Africa to fasten a demand on the soil from Hama to the river of Egypt? And then he says, no, no, no. There is a country without a nation, a nation without a country, his own beloved, my still uh, loved people, the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is not when Christian Zionism started. It started 400 years ago, and Robert Smith wrote a book on that. I encourage you to read if you are interested. So now, after these changes, churches were allowed to be built, and all the European empires started flocking to Palestine to start operation. The first church 
to be built was 1839 to the right, Christ Church, by the English Empire. The one to the left in Nazareth, also by the English Empire. Here, one to the left, it's uh, the, the Russian compound in Jerusalem by the Russian Empire. To the left, Notre Dame by the French Empire. So the Europeans started schools. They built hospitals. This is a hospital in Jerusalem, and this is the, the German emperor. Look at, at these just figures. These are from 1917s, just schools. There were 116 Catholic schools built from 1839 to 1917, 116. 100 Russian Orthodox schools, 52 Protestant schools, 22 Greek Orthodox schools, a total of 29 Christian schools, making 62.5% from the total number of schools in Palestine at that time. There were only 174 governmental schools operating that year. I mean, imagine all of this. And by the way, all, all large churches in Palestine were built by empires. From the Church of the Nativity by Theodosius, from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, all churches of the 19th century, the Dome of the Rock was built by an empire, not by the Muslims of Palestine. The, the big synagogue in Jerusalem was built by an empire. It's always empires who was putting all of these large structures. So that was going on. The only time in this 200 years that, the, that we got new Christian comers was between 1894 to 1923 when the Turks actually persecuted the Armenians and the Syrian Orthodox, and many of them came and to, to Bethlehem, to Jerusalem, and they continue to be among us from that time. Another important uh, milestone in our history was the year 1907, because in that year, there was a shift in the uh, Turkish uh, um, government, a new, uh, uh, a new uh, party came to rule, and they decided to draft the Christians to military. Up to that moment, Christians were exempted from the military. We had to pay for it, but we were exempted. 1907, they started drafting them to the, to, the, uh, to the military. Some of them, like this gentleman from Ramallah, went into the military, but many refused. And so what did they do? They started boarding ships going anywhere except Palestine. And this is when we lost a huge number of our Palestinian Christian community. Look at these, again, figures. Half of the Christians in Bethlehem, and Christian was a, 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 Bethlehem was a Christian town, 50% of the Christians of Bethlehem left the city that year. One third of the Christians of Bejala left the city that year. So that today we have around half a million of Latin American uh, with Palestinian roots, living in Chile, Honduras, and many other countries in Latin and South America. Okay? So, that was the first stage. So, lots of churches, but also Christian migration. The second stage, the betrayal of the empire. We saw what... Uh, uh, Look at this. The Germans sided with the Ottomans, allowing for the genocide of the Armenians and Syrian Christians. 1.5 million Christians were slaughtered. The British promised Palestine to the Jewish people. Another betrayal. 
Sorry for the, Engli for the British among us. I cannot, that's history. So. The French, they were interested in a piece of the cake, the land, not in the people. The Russian lost ground in 1917, so that was over. What did this mean? That's the Balfour Declaration. I will skip it. Uh, England promising to the Jewish, to the Jews, Palestine. Now, let me look at the myth of the land without a people. Let's have a look at Palestine between 1917 and 1948. Especially, let's look at the Palestinian Christian community. What were they doing? A land with a pe without a people? I mean, you have Jaffa, a flourishing city. On, uh, on the bottom, you have Nazareth. That's the Christian uh, section of Nazareth in the 20s. A thriving city. Look at... To the left, you have the first, the first Arab woman photographer in the Middle East. Started 1918. Believe me, at that time in New York, there were no women photographers. She was, by the way, a PK, pastor's kid. I mean, it's everything but a land without a people. There was a thriving middle class. Look at the fashion made in Palestine, 1930s. Look at the toys that young Samir, his name, from Bethlehem, is having, 1834. You don't have these toys even today with Lego and all these kinds of things. We had an airport that was the major hub in the region, much bigger than the Beirut or the Amman airport, Jerusalem airport. We had a thriving economy. Just this picture for economy I chose the Jaffa oranges that are sold and, as an Israeli invention, they were a Palestinian fruit. And the Palestinian businessmen were shipping this all over the world. You have the shipment of the, of the oranges there down. These oranges were sold in the middle of Berlin in the 20s by Palestinian businessmen, talking about a land without a people. Women entrepreneurs, you cannot imagine how many Christian women entrepreneurs were there uh, at that time in Palestine. This is uh, 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 Miss Ratibe, 1922, she, de she decided to open a Christian school for girls in Bethlehem. And guess what? Can you recognize this entrance? It's the entrance of our hotel here, because that was her school. And uh, this picture is taken in the lobby of the, that's graduation ceremony. With her was another woman. She started Birzeit University, that 1926. She was with her in Bethlehem, then she decided to spread the word, to do mission work. So she went to Birzeit and started a school that developed to a university. So by women, entrepreneurs in the 20s. I, I tell you, even in Washington at that time, there weren't that many in, women entrepreneurs. Committed leadership. This picture is taken in the 30s by that woman photographer. And in the, this is one family. In that family, we have four pastors, four Protestant pastors, four brothers having taken care of four congregations, Palestinian Christian congregations. A cultural and religious life. Uh, this man from... Uh, 
from Haifa, Aziz Domat, uh, was a, a, a script writer. He was writing theater. 1936, he was the nominee for the Nobel Prize of Literature. Unfortunately, he lost it because he forgot to submit one paper. But he was number one on the list, 1936. Talking about sport, our sport teams were actually, I have this picture, but I didn't put it here. They were competing worldwide, even with canoeing on the thyme in London. And um, this is actually a Christmas, uh, uh, a Christmas um, play. This picture is taken from the, the other room by the lobby of the, of the here of the restaurant. Mobility, I mean, imagine uh, this uh, woman photographer, that's her car. And she had 1920s, four studios, one in Nazareth, one in Haifa, one in Jerusalem, one in Bethlehem. And she was driving with this car between those four. Imagine a land without a people. Now, this was going on, and suddenly, all of these Western missionaries started coming to Palestine, those who taught uh, Pastor Alex, you know. They started to come to Palestine and say, you know what? All of this, what we saw, is totally irrelevant because this land belongs to the Jews. And so, if you think that Christ of the Checkpoint was the first one to start talking about Christian Zionism, look at this pastor, Saeed Aboud, 1936. He was having Bible studies in Bethlehem at Christmas Lutheran Church on Jesus and the land, Zionism, and the prophecies of the Old Testament. That's documented. So the problems came with the empire. So that was the second stage. I will come to the third stage. 1948, the catastrophe. And I think among the theologian among us, if you want to understand, and I don't even think that our people even understand that. They live it, but they don't understand it. If you want to understand what happened 1948, what we call the catastrophe, you have to compare it with the year 587, the Babylonian invasion. That, by the way, was our first Nakba, not this one because we have been going from one Nakba to the other, because empires just keep coming and occupying Palestine. So the war started, and here you have, that was the thriving Christian quarter in West Jerusalem today, it was set on fire, and in the bottom you have uh, Jaffa Gate. What, what, what they have now a, a, a shopping center that was destroyed used to belong mainly for Palestinian Christian family. Uh, they had their, one of the first uh, printing uh, companies in Palestine. So we lost our land and our property. This is a picture of Notre Dame, 1948. And we became a refugee nation. Imagine the pictures from the 20s and 30s. Because of this promise, suddenly we became a nation of refugees. So the church started responding mainly through social welfare because, you know, people lost everything. And the only response the church has was, you know, to give food, etc. Look at the demographic changes that happened because of an Nakba. We did this, and we have this book is available here with the books. Uh, that's the first time you will, you will see it. If you look at this demographic uh, um, picture, you see that 1948, there is a crack in the numbers of Muslims and of Christians. It's only the Jews that kept going up, because exactly that what happened in 1948. Look at this one. We did here a projection. What if, what if there was no Nakba 1948? 
The projection, you can see it there, it shows that we would have today in Palestine 560,000 Palestinian Christians making 10% of the population. You can, I'm not sure if you can see it, but 1947, the percentage of Palestinian Christians of the total population was 8%. After a Nakba, within three months, it dropped to 2.8%. And since then, it never recovered. From 8% to 28 today it's even less than, than, than. So how can you see all of this and say what happened 48 was the fulfillment of the prophets? That was a catastrophe. It was a catastrophe for the Christian community. 700,000 Palestinian people became refugees. Among them, there were 50,000 Palestinian Christian refugees, making 7% of the population at that time. And look, uh, uh, so we lost that year alone one-third of the Palestinian Christian population. The number of Christians declined. Now look at this by city. West Jerusalem, 88% of the Christians of West Jerusalem became refugees and left West Jerusalem. And their homes are still standing there, and there are Jewish people living there now. And these people, these Christians, their, their kids, they live still here, and they, they drive every day by these homes, and they know that was the, the, the home of their grandpa. Jaffa lost 73% of its Christian population that year. Lidda lost 70% of the Palestinian Christian population that year, and Haifa lost 52%. But for me, as a theologian, what happened in 48 wasn't that we lost our land only. The church lost its voice, and our people lost their voice. We lost our long-term memory. We started believing in these Christian Zionists who wanted to tell us we are aliens at home. We are not. And we lost our narrative. We forgot, actually, our story. Part of it is the biblical story. And we lost all that accumulative knowledge and know-how that was gathering over these 150 years. That's exactly what happened in 1948. So I come to the fourth. I have to finish uh, in a few minutes. 1967, Israel occupied the West Bank and Gaza Strip and the Golan Heights. And many, again, Christians in Europe and the U.S. thought this was divine intervention. I had even people from Indonesia, they were telling me, we were praying for Israel to win that war. Imagine praying for war. But it's interesting, five days after that war, June 1967, on the 11th, a group of Christian theologians met in Beirut, and they had the first document, theological document, they called it a theological perspective on the Arab-Israeli conflict. Because all of these Christian Zionists were, were, were telling them this is divine intervention, they had to respond theologically. And this is when theological Palestinian response actually started. But that year, actually 1967, is the beginning of the religious fundamentalism in our region. It started with Christian Zionism as religious fundamentalism, with Jewish fundamentalism, and then got the response of Muslim fundamentalism. All modern fundamentalism that we see has to do with the year 67, because people believed it was divine intervention, and so the Muslim has to show it wasn't divine intervention. I will come to the last, defending the faith, defending the land, the wake up call 1987. 1987 is the, day, is the year of the first intifada. By the way, it's not the first intifada. I don't like to carry the first intifada because we had many intifadas in our history. We had intifada the year 66 to 70 against the Romans. We have another intifada 132 to 134 against, again, the Roman. 
our, our history is full with intifadas, okay? But this was a very important one because that myth of David and Goliath started shaking. Suddenly, it was the Palestinian kid who became David, and it was the Israeli occupation who was the empire. Here, the church started to act differently than before. There was an awakening, and we see this on the theological responses. 1988, one year after the Intifada, a group of Palestinian theologians uh, came together and wrote a document called Theology and the Local Church. That same year, all heads of churches in Jerusalem started for the first time writing together joint statements. It has to do with the Intifada. And it is, the, uh, it is in this context that we see the emergence of institutionalized responses. So we have al Center, we have the Sabil, we have DR, we have Bible College, Christ at the Checkpoint, we have Bethlehem University, and many, many, many more, and lots of theological writing and publications. I mean, almost every book written by a Palestinian theologian was written after 1987. It's not by chance. So these are just part of the, of the, of the books that were published, for example, by al -Liqa. Here are some others. Some of the authors are sitting here. They recognize their books. I don't have all books. At least I have some. Uh, Okay, and many, many more. I, I, I think we just pulled out together. You cannot imagine how many theological books were written by Palestinian theologians starting 1987. So these are my books, uh, commercial. Uh, uh, most of the figures that I showed you are taken from these three studies that we did, another commercial. Uh, we heard about Kairos Palestine today. That was the last document and the last response in uh, 2009. Let me end with one more because today in Palestine, we are living again under imperial occupation. And this occupation is making the life very difficult for us. If you want to understand the heat of the empire, look at this. This is why I chose Bethlehem as an example, because 50% of the Palestinian Christian community in the West Bank, they live in and around Bethlehem, Beit Sahur, Beit Jala. This was the boundaries of Bethlehem 1967 when, when, when Israel occupied Bethlehem, including the Dead Sea. If you go to float in the Dead Sea, remember you are floating on Bethlehem land, actually. And so what happened to Bethlehem is that the empire, first of all, took the northern part of Bethlehem annexed it to Jerusalem. Then they built 19 settlements to bring new comers to our land. Then they declared all of this area C and later a, a, a military zone, which means we cannot even go there. And this was declared green area, but Green area usually is the first step to build a settlement there, the second step. So most probably we are expecting a huge Jewish settlement there. And by the way, in the middle there, in that small settlement in the middle, this is where Lieberman, the Israeli foreign minister, lives. And then they had these two bypass roads basically confining Bethlehem just to these three cities, Bethlehem, Beit Sahur, Beit Jala. More settlements. Then came the wall, more barriers, more checkpoints. And so basically, if you look here, the little town of Bethlehem, and you will be singing about it again on Christmas. When you sing that, remember that Bethlehem is being made as little as four, four square miles. Four square miles. And this is where 50% of the Palestinian population live. So. If you live in Bethlehem, if you live in Palestine, and you are facing all the time recurring empires, it is not by chance that the church continue to cry out 
your kingdom come. We heard in the, in the, in the Bible study about the kingdom of God that brings equality, that, that brings stability, that restore the people. This is why the cry for the kingdom didn't originate in Egypt, nor in Syria, nor in the US, nor at Westminster. It originated in Bethlehem, and it could have been originated only in Bethlehem because our people have been crushed over and over and over again by the empire, and yet they refused to give in. They kept praying, thy kingdom come, and they believed that God is calling them to embody the kingdom here and now. Thank you.